Welcome back to Across the Board with Ian the Colonel here on AcrossTheBoardRadio.com and HawkRadio.org. Talking about mid-Atlantic bands, you know, we had the Clarks on uh, a few weeks ago. Right. Great band out of the mid-Atlantic region. Uh, one of my favorites has got to be, and whether you're talking about you're into rock or blues or, or you know, rhythm and blues, got to be homegrown Kelly Bell himself and the Kelly Bell Band. Kelly, how you doing today? What's happening? What's happening? Every, in the Colonel. Right. Good every, to be on across the board. How you brothers doing? Uh, we're Real we're doing good. great today, man. We appreciate it. You know, always good to to talk to you. Uh, you know, a local guy with us as well. But again, a local guy that has gone. You know, international. You know, just everybody knows Kelly Bell and, and, and the band. And I'll tell you, and I'm not even hyping you up just because you know you're uh, you know a local act or, or from this area. I shouldn't say you're not local at all, but. Uh, yeah, we haven't been local in a long time. Right. right. You know, I'm proud to be from Missouri. We've been blessed. What can I say, you know? Absolutely. But what I'm saying is that, that I love Kelly Bell. My sister loves Kelly Bell. She, my older sister loves Kelly Bell. My mom. Really? What's your older sister look like? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's uh, she's married, so you know if her husband's listening, yeah, that, that's between you and him. I don't know. They live they live up in Frederick. I know you play that area a lot. So uh, I love Fred Neck quite a bit. There yeah. you go, Fred Neck for sure, man. Um, but my mom loves uh, Kelly Bell as well. I mean, she she sits there and listens to Kelly Bell at work. She's got your you know your CDs as well. So well, that's it's... awesome. What does your mom look like? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying, eight to eighty blind cripple or crazy. She's within that range, you know. She is single, so there you go, man. Uh, but yeah, so uh, it's it's music that appeals to everybody, and we love it, man. So now, tell us a little bit about the formation of the band. Now, I've read that you guys actually formed as a backup band for the man himself, Bo Diddley. Yes, this is absolutely true. Uh, uh, back in '95, actually, when the band first started, um, uh, I was approached by Giles Cook, who was then the manager and owner of the Eight by Ten Club in Baltimore which was, mm -hmm. like, you know, long before the record and a lot of other, you know, uh, Rams had mm -hmm. was ever developed. The 8 by 10 was the place to come see live music. Absolutely. Was. And uh, a lot of great acts came through there. Uh, and Bo Diddley happened to be coming in town. And I was in a band called Fat Tuesday, playing Congress, singing back up. Right. I think I'd step out and sing a song or two here and there, a set, you know. But certainly not fronting my own thing. I wasn't the lead singer. Um and a good friend of mine, uh, Automatic Slim, who uh, moved on to his own band, uh, right. Automatic Slim and the Ugly Babysitters, <laughs> and, uh, which I still think is the coolest blues name ever. That's a great yeah. band name. Um, and some other cats that were in the Persuaders. Okay. Um, Fat Tuesday wasn't really interested in doing the backup Bo Tilly gig. But Giles Cook had come to me and said, look, you know, I got, a, I got this gig. Bo's coming in town. And how Bo traditionally did things back then, uh, once he started getting paid, finally, um, you know, he would do, he would book a show in D.C., book a show in Baltimore. Both clubs would pay him five grand. One club would be responsible for his flight. The other club would be responsible for his lodging. Okay. Um, but both clubs would have to hire a backup band, and you get about twenty minutes before the show really to work on them. And both give you two. He'd give you two hours. You know, he'd give you you know one two hour set or two one hour sets. And for most clubs, they would want to do one two hour set clear the house and do it all over again. You know, right. eight by ten is a club is a small club, so that's pretty much what they did. So the gig was for us to go out, play an hour, and then bring Bo out for an hour. But like I said, the band I was interested in wasn't really interested in doing that. They had done it. They'd been together twenty years. I was the baby of the band. And so they had done it for Muddy Waters and Wolf and, you know, a lot of other blues cat. Right. But I didn't you know, I was kinda of saddened by this, but Slim happened to be sitting in with us that night just forcing around. He said, Man, take the gig, I'll find you the backup musicians, I want you to blow this opportunity. And so I wanted to go into the Baltimore Blues All-Stars. And Slim said, are you crazy? Go into your own name. You never know if you want to do this again. And I said, I'm, man, I know I don't want to do this again. You know, this is too much pressure, too much, you know, I just, you know, I like singing. I like being in the background. Right. And uh, he said, no, he convinced me to go ahead and go into my own name, which I did. And, and uh, it was very successful. Uh, Bo loved us and decided that he wanted us. So for the next maybe four years or so, every time he came anywhere near the East Coast, you know, he's like, hey, get, get that Kelly Bell band. I like them, boy. I like them a lot. You know? <laughs> and what, that was saying something for Bo Diddley to like you. Uh, <laughs> Let yeah. me tell you. Because after all the years of being ripped off and everything else, that and all the, all the things that he dealt with in the business uh, at that time in our country, believe me, he, you know, uh, he, he wasn't a fan of a lot of things in regards to the music business. But uh, he, he was definitely a fan of ours. And so that was, you know, a blessing in disguise. So the actual first show of the Kelly Bell band was 
uh, backing up Bo Diddley and, you know, doing a set out, you know, getting the crowd warmed up. They cleared the house, and then we did it all over again. That's amazing to hear an endorsement from a legend like that. And yeah, like you said, he had gone through a lot with, uh, you know, getting paid by promoters and that sort of thing. And we heard, oh, a, yeah. we heard a lot about that from uh, George Clinton when he was recently on the show as well. He talked about the same thing. He was, you know, a few years later in, in the you know game when he was coming through, but still yeah, interesting funny. stuff. Yeah, Actually, we were supposed to open up for George Clinton about, we were supposed to play with him. About three weeks ago, and oh, just yeah. when George got a staff, he was sick. Yeah, he, he was yeah. out for the weekend. Yeah, he was on the and, show just uh, be- yeah, just before that. Taj Mahal uh, actually sat in for him. They flew Taj okay. Mahal in, so nice. and we still played the show. We was you know they had fifteen thousand people show up, so I guess they still had to have a show. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> so sure. uh, we put on a great show, and Taj Mahal, you know, he he rocked it. If I had to have another blues cat that was on my bucket list. It certainly was Taj Mahal, so it was great to be able to meet him and hang out with him. He was a real nice guy, too. So. Uh, that's a great call. What, what was Slim's band name again? Some, the Ugly Babysitters? Automatic Slim and the Ugly Babysitters. It's pretty good. It's no Dead Deer Dan, but it's pretty good. I'll, right. I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it for sure. <laughs> uh, Kelly. So, I mean, from, from that, you know, I, you know I, I did the blues cover thing. And we started The club started to get calls about the Kelly Bell Band, which was funny because it was calls for a band that didn't even really exist. Um, so I had to kind of put it together. And so, you know, and for the first couple of years, I did the hired musician thing, you know, where you just you hire some of the cats you know to come back you up. And I'm doing mostly blues covers at that point anyway. So it was, you know, when you get good guys, they, they can pick up on stuff easy. So you give them the key, you give them the tempo, and you go. And after you've right. been playing with those guys for a while, and you had a pretty good pool of guys that you could work with, you know, you didn't have to. It wasn't a whole. It wasn't a lot of discussion on stage. You, the guys knew what you wanted to do. So let's. Um, but then I started writing my own music. And uh, that's a little bit more difficult to do with pickup guys, you know, because the changes uh, in our music, even though we write fairly simple songs, the music is rather complicated at times. Mm-hmm. And you can't necessarily call that stuff on stage or, you know, without rehearsing it. You got, you, I mean, we, we've been playing together 16 years and we still rehearse at least once a week. So, I mean, it, it, just to keep it tight, make it sound tight, make it sound the way it's supposed to be and not take advantage of our fans' time, you know, we, I had to solidify bands. So uh, a couple years after the band actually started, I solidified the band and and finished up uh, the recording of our first record, Fat Blues Music, mm-hmm. which is the type of music we play. Um, and every and that broke all the regional records for uh, regional acts. It sold like uh, like thirty thousand units right out of the gate. It was just crazy. So um, you know we've been very blessed, and and, and we haven't really looked back. And uh, it's led me, being in this business, has led me to do a lot of other really cool things, like become a professional wrestler, which is, you know, I've always been a big mark for wrestling. I've done that for the last eight or nine years and do a lot of radio work, which is great. You know, guys like Kirk McEwen and Mickey Coachella getting me up on the air, and now I've been doing it all up and down the East Coast. So I've been lucky, man. We've done movies, commercials, everything that I can possibly imagine. One day we rewrote the Ravens theme song, even though I'm a Redskins fan. Oh, that's hard, was, hard, hard to do these days, man. It was tough, but it was pretty cool standing like uh, the year that, that Jamal broke the rushing record. Um, we were standing on the field for that playoff game. Oh yeah, well, yeah, it was amazing because we had rewritten uh, with John Modell. We had rewritten the Ravens theme song, and a lot of people don't know he actually wrote the Ravens theme song. Didn't know that. How he's actually a phenomenal musician. Who are you a fan of on the Redskins now? I mean, I, I you know I'm from this area as well, so I'm also uh, you know an at heart Redskins fan. But it's hard, Kelly. It's hard it's right hard now. Hard to be a fan now, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, who it is so hard? Who's gonna throw for us? Who 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 can we be fans of now? I don't know, man. I mean, I I just I don't understand what they're doing. I really don't. And if if I want to be angry and depressed about it, I'll just call my mom. <laughs> What's your mom because look she's like? The biggest red <laughs> she's kind of hot, actually. Okay. Because <laughs> um, if I said anything else, she punched me in the face. Right. She carries a gun, so you know whatever. <laughs> you want to go out, my mom? You go right ahead. No. But, uh, I don't know. Sounds pretty violent yeah. to me. I like her already. Yeah, you better treat her right. <laughs> she'll take care of things. So let, let's switch then from Kelly Bell the band to Kelly Bell the man. You, you know, we were going to talk about the actor, screenwriter, and the professional wrestler. Let's get into the professional wrestler bit. Describe to people what exactly that entails for you. Are you you go under the name what Blues Man, right? Yeah, Fat Blues Kelly Bell. I still, I mean, it, it would have been impossible for me to walk into something and try to pretend I was somebody else when people already knew me. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, it started at Maryland Championship Wrestling and uh, Corporal Punishment and Mark the Shark Schrader. These cats owned uh, Maryland Championship Wrestling, MCW, which was 
the, one of the bigger uh, independents in the country and still is. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would go to their shows because they gave me tickets, and I, I, give, I trade tickets to my shows. So I'm at, I'm just behind, you know, and then just hanging out in the dressing room, being a wrestling mark, you know, which is what they call fan. Right. And um, just sitting there watching, and I'm going, man, I've always dreamed of this. And, and these guys look at me and they go, really? <laughs> and they're thinking, of course, they see dollar signs. They figure your name is going to sell tickets. So sure. we'll train you if you want to be a wrestler. And I'm like, okay, guys, but let's talk show business, <laughs> you know. Right. So let's talk about how you're going to train me, what's it going to cost you, you know, and that kind of thing. And they worked out so they worked out a deal that yeah, has been running for now probably about nine years. Wow. And uh, I've done it all. I've worked with, you know, the Sandman, Eddie Guerrero, you know, and, you know, God rest his soul. A lot of, a lot of King Kong, Bundy, Jim, Superfly, Jimmy Snuka. Really? Superfly? Uh, oh, yeah. I, you know, uh, I'll tell you one of the nicest guys I've worked with was Tito Santana. You remember him? Oh, yeah, yeah for sure. But, um, and and, and most, for most of my career, I've been a heel, which is a bad guy, you know. Right. I remember one time uh, we were in Dundalk, and I, my 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 buddy uh, uh, Buzz Stryker, who was, who was uh, my tag team partner, I look at Buzz and I go, and it was right before I wrestled Tino Santana. So you know, a lot of times I go out, obviously they give me a lot of time on a stick, on the microphone, you know, and I go out and I just bury the crowd and I bury my opponent. Right. And then I, you know, I so I go out and I say to Buzz and I go, Hey Buzz, what does a fat white girl from Dundalk? And a brick having come, <laughs> and he goes, well, "I don't know what, boss." I said, "It's just a matter of time before they both get laid by Mexicans." Oh, <laughs> and, then, and then you drop that, and then of course Tito Santana then comes out and then beats the hell out of me, afterwards, right? You know, yeah. But uh, but you know the respect business in wrestling is very powerful. You know, so I mean, I went to Tito before I even went out there and asked his permission to be able to drop that bomb on him, you know. And right. he's like, man, you go ahead and get your heat. He's like, that's hilarious. You that's know, so great. he was real cool about it, you know. Yeah, he was definitely... So it, it, it was very respectful, but of course, it was supposed to be, you know, supposed to look disrespectful right. out in the crowd, you know. He understood the business and what it, what it meant. It, he knew it wasn't anything personal. He just knew that was part of the show, the act. Yeah, I mean, he saw, he, that's, what, that's what it's called in the business, called getting your heat, you know. Right. You want... Yeah. Uh, let me tell you, dude, uh, it's easy... I've been doing this entertainment thing for so long, it's easy for me to, and I'm not, not that I take it for granted, but it's easy for me to get the crowd to pop. Right. You know, to get the crowd to cheer. And, you know, you go and say the right name of the town or, you know, hey, let's party tonight and all this other stuff. You know, I mean, that's, that's what you do, you know, because people want to know they had a good time. But getting people to boo is a whole different animal, dude. Really? It's a whole different animal because if you, the worst thing in the world, I've done some recent, recently I've done, you know, I've had my first stand up comedy. I just did a show at the uh, at the uh, Comedy Factory in Baltimore okay. a couple weeks ago. So, and there's stuff on our site. If anybody wants to check that out, you can go to kellybellband. dot com mm-hmm. or fatblues p h a t dot com, and or I'll check, find us find us the Kelly Bell Band on Facebook. And there's all kinds of stuff on there. And you can see pictures of my my comic debut. But um, <laughs> it's a, it's different, man. It's way different trying to get people to boo you than to cheer. Because you think about it. You, you got a guy, and not to be stereotypical, but you got a guy who worked his tail off all week. He takes his three kids and his wife to the wrestling show, the local wrestling show, you know, in whatever state we happen to be in. Right. And, you know, he, he's there. He's got a $6 beer in his hand. His kids are there. Here I come walking up the aisle, and I'm calling his kids brats, and I'm calling his wife fat and all this other stuff. Right. And he gets pissed off, and he throws his $6 beer at me. And right as it leaves his fingertips, he remembers, oh, wait a minute, this isn't exactly real. Right. But the $6 I spent on this beer is. Mm. And that's my job <laughs> as an entertainer, as a wrestler, to make him forget. Because if, if he can forget long enough to throw that beer, to really get pissed and throw that beer at me, then he's forgetting about everything else that occurred during his week. That's a good point, man. Well, and, that's a good way to look at it. And that's my job. And that's my job. And I, I want an off stage, you know. And... Then when he's walking to the car with his kids, his kids are putting him over like, Dad, you're the coolest way you do that period, Kelly Bell, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and these are the same folks that are sitting out of waiting outside after the show to get my autograph. That's but, incredible. You know, he's, you know, the kids are like, yeah, Dad, you're the coolest. And they come home because they're told their buddies at school what Dad did. And Dad comes home and he smacks his wife on the butt, you know, when he comes home from work the next day and he doesn't kick the dog for once. You know, all, and I think, you know what, I gave that to him. Like it to your right. mom. Uh, yeah, and that's and that's where and that's how I see entertainment. Period. You know, I'm an artist. True, I am an artist. 
Um, you know, and that and that includes the music too. But I never take my audience for granted. People come to escape, you know, so that they can get that energy together, so they can come back and deal with the idiot who keeps stealing the lunch and that that you know sleeps in the cubicle three doors down from them. No doubt. Which is more nerve wracking, uh, performing music in front of a live audience, professional wrestling in front of a live audience, or stand up comedy in front of a live audience? Stand up comedy is probably one of the hardest fans in the world and I'm I'm lucky because I haven't had I haven't bombed you know and Mickey who is really my mentor in all of this who says you just need to go somewhere where nobody knows you and just bomb like you just need to be terrible right. so you can know what that really feels like mm-hmm. and and I said you know I'm, I've just been lucky because everything I've done you know has gone over really well and not that I consider myself the funniest guy in the world I certainly don't that would be Don Rickles but <laughs> um, <laughs> But I, I'm, I'm lucky that, you know, I have been so successful. So, yeah, I mean, it's nothing worse probably than standing up there and having no one. I've seen guys go through this. Nobody laughing at your jokes. A room full of silence sucks. Well, so I'd say that was probably the hardest. But the second hardest would definitely be wrestling. Because, it, you know, when I've been, man, I've been hit with everything. I've dealt with thumbtacks and fire and going through tables and chairs. And let me tell you, when you're trying to remember certain things in a match, and somebody has hit you in the head with a chair because don't. There's nothing fake about a chair. There's nothing <laughs> fake about uh, tables. They don't gimmick them. You know, people think, well, they must have sawed that table. No, nobody saws a table. It's just physics. You hit it in the middle with enough force, it breaks. It breaks. And that's what it is. You know, you you. Is there a certain way you hit somebody with a chair? Yeah, but it's still a steel chair. It hurts. So trying to remember what you're supposed to be doing after somebody just wrapped you across the head three times. <laughs> <laughs> you, you might need a couple of seconds to remember what you guys talked about, you know. Understandably. And how does doing the things that you've done off the stage, you know, with wrestling and the stand-up comedy, how does that help translate the energy that you put into your show and give to the crowd and, and how, how to react to how they're reacting to you? Well, I know, um, like, you know, there's, there's one part of our show, since you guys are familiar with the show. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, how we do, like, a 30-second like gimmick song, like we'll do 30 seconds of a journey song or right. something. Oh, that, yeah. And it came, we, we started doing this way back in the day because we played so many rock and roll clubs. Like we were one of the first blues bands I know to kind of step out and start playing these rock clubs. And that's what really helped our, our popularity rather than playing these little $300, $500 a night blues clubs where they don't, well, the sound system, the only thing in the sound system, first of all, a sound on the stick and they only have vocals in it, you know. Right. Because they kind of, count on the volume from the amps and, the, and the, you know, on the stage. Um, and there's, if you're lucky, you might have one monitor or something like that. So that, that's how we started, you know. But, you know, thankfully a guy, Chris Keith, uh, who managed Jimmy's Chicken Shack and a lot of other acts uh, and was one of the founders of File, File Records, had discovered, discovered us at, uh, at the Federal Hill Fun Fest. And here we are, this blues act in the midst of all these other, you know, rock and roll acts and, and everything else. And uh, like Bo Diddley said, you know, rock and roll is maybe just merely the baby that blues had, you know. Mm-hmm. So we're up there doing our thing. And Chris, he didn't, not that he was a huge, huge blues fan, but he couldn't deny the entertainment value of what we're doing. Because I had jokes and I had, you know, like he's like, why are all these people paying attention to this guy? And why are they dancing to songs that I know they've heard a thousand times? But they're not like radio songs. They're blues cover songs. Like what? And like he's doing them a little different, but that's about it. And um, he saw all of that and saw the, the marketing value in it. And he kind of helped me groom my show. And as, like I said, and I was at, as I was making the transition to original music at that point, and and I was, and that's how fat blues music kind of developed. You know, P H A T. And if people ask me all the time about what is fat blues music, and I tell them that. If you can imagine Muddy Waters wearing a Bob Marley t-shirt riding on Black Sabbath's tour bus on the way to Parliament and Funkadella concert listening to a James Brown 8-track tape humming a Run DMC song with a Nighthawks ball cap on, all in the glory of Bo Diddley, that would be just close to what I do. I like it. I like it. You, <laughs> you haven't rehearsed that at all, have you? Huh? <laughs> yes, you haven't rehearsed that bit at all, have you? I don't rehearse anything. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's part of my problem. <laughs> right. Now It helps to be the ADD. Yeah, right. It always does. <laughs> You've had such crowd favorites. Ain't like it used to be is a big crowd favorite. But I think one of the big crowd favorites is the song Homegrown. Now, I've listened to this song, and I've heard you guys play it numerous, numerous times, and I still can't quite figure out what it's about. Well, <laughs> funny you say 
say that. <laughs> it's about growing uh, corn or it, something, it, right? It's a I've farm song. I've heard song. a lot of different interpretations. Uh, I've heard uh, about the guys who've come to me have said something about, you know, falling in love with a woman from the South. Yeah. Um, and oh, okay. kind of a Southern Belle type of thing. I see. Um, I have talked to people who, like, saw it as, as falling in love with someone from afar or okay. someone from your hometown. I've heard so many different, different, uh, you know, interpretations of it. Uh, one of my favorites was um, cats who spend an entirely too much college time uh, in the bathroom that they shared with their suite mate with the towel rolled up and stuff. At right. The bottom. <laughs> exactly. Or uh-huh. someone that has an old toilet paper roll with dry oil sheet stuff in it so that, they, <laughs> so that things can go out of mom's uh, bedroom window so mm-hmm. she would not know. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Um, these are just, you know, interpretations. But, you know, it's a bad idea, honestly, to, to tell people really what song's about, like, unless you're on VH1 Storytellers. Right. Because it kind of ruins it for other people. That's true. You know, when they find out what you thought about when you wrote the song, and plus we're talking about a song that I wrote, you know, 15 years ago. Yeah. 15 years ago. And... So, I mean, I, you know, that's that, uh, for them to, to feel my interpretation, I, I would hate to rob someone of that. And just because you wrote it one way doesn't mean it's going to be interpreted another way. You know, different people have different ways that they hear that. And like you said, you don't want to take that away from them because, you know, some song, you know, might be, I guess, you know, like, for example, Sabbath Sweet Leaf might be written about something and maybe someone takes it as something else. Right. It's right. Like, yeah, that you person. never know. It's a completely different thing. Can you guys hold for a second? Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Oh, yeah. So whatever your interpretation is, <laughs> that's up to you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> things happen. Things happen. Um, what you need to do. Yeah, right? <laughs> I thought I heard some bubbling in the background there. I'm not really I'm sure. Not. Are you, you're near a small no stream? I have no event. <laughs> are, you, are you near a small stream right now? If it right works now? for Clinton, damn it, it'll work for me. That's right. <laughs> yeah, actually, you know, we, we asked him what uh, – the craziest thing he ever asked for in a contract rider was, and he said, "If I don't even know." He said, "If you can't remember it," or he said, "If you can remember it, you weren't there." I was like, "That's a great call, <laughs> I, man." Uh, um, when when I said Clinton, although that is a very important George is a very important one, I kind of meant the president. Bro. Oh, that oh that Clinton, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, way to say it with current events. Bro. <laughs> hey, oh, they well. they all smoke weed. I don't know. <laughs> it sounds like- you know, you see, you see one blue dress, you've seen them all. Right, you know exactly. Yeah. Hey, honey, yeah. throw that in the wash, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Don't save it, you idiot. <laughs> Whereas it were, yeah, you've come across one blue dress, you've come across them. Anyway, um, hey, hello. Yeah. <laughs> that might have to be edited. I think it'll be fine. Anyway, no, be fine. Kelly, uh, uh, let's. Fine. Talk, how about this uh, for uh, for for blues fans and for you being a, a blues man? If you could say you you're, you could pass down a time capsule to your family or to younger blues musicians and it was a time capsule that represented you know say this was the only thing you had to show them what blues was what would you put in i mean it could be three cds or it could be you know whatever i would put in i would put in uh the robert johnson collection oh good call i would put in uh a classic picture of Muddy Waters. Okay. Um, and I would put in uh, the Duke recordings of Bobby Blue Bland. Ooh. Okay. So that you can hear what a real blue singer is supposed to sound like. It's, it's very good. I like that. And what do you? Th- I mean, do you think that blues? I mean, I know it's, you know, music and, has changed oh, wait so much. A minute. One more thing. Sure, I would put in a guitar from Stevie Ray Vaughan. Because cool. you're talking about the four guys I met changed the face that, that I just mentioned. Mm-hmm. All changed the face of music. Oh, yeah, right. Muddy sure. Waters moved from the Delta. I mean, Robert came from the Delta and established. I mean, he, he was one of the first guys really to get that some of that stuff recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, even though he would play one thing for recording and then, you know, go, go play something else. Uh Bobby Bland really showed he made a transition from the 50s, you know, 50s music, and he's still playing. I was right. just with him uh, in New York uh, a 
about two months ago for his birthday. Wow. He just turned 81, and he's still doing mm. the thing. It still sounds great. Mm. And, um, you know, I mean, cats like B.B. King, too. You know, no I mean, B.B. King played one note on his guitar, and you know who it is. Mm-hmm. But Stevie Ray Vaughan changed the way blues guitar is played, period. You know, Muddy Waters moved from the Delta and moved to Chicago, plugged in, had little Walter pick up an amp. Nobody was playing with effects through an amp or harmonica. Right. You know, nobody was doing that. And, and Muddy said, no, no, wait a minute. <laughs> get little Walter in here and let him get his amp. And let's see what kind of sounds he gets out of here. And they just changed the face of music. People talk about the Beatles and all of that. And, I'm, and I don't deny it. I'm not a Beatles hater. Don't get me wrong. I'm a fan of their music. But they were banned for six years. And and they talk about the, these wonderful things that they did with the wall of sound and all that stuff. And I mean, and the truth is, a lot of that stuff was just blind luck. Yeah. Okay. A lot of the stuff they got was luck. And because people admired them and loved them so much, they make a bigger deal out of some of the sound stuff that they got out that wasn't intentional. And people talk about how it was and all this other stuff. And, you know, I'm like, come on, man. I mean, <laughs> how, how are you going to put that up against, you know, the Rolling Stones who have been touring for four years? Right. And and we're still, you know, three years ago with a top grossing act. And started out as a blues everybody. band. Yeah. You know, right. And, uh, I mean, how can you how can you put that up against the money? Uh, you know, B.B. King who's been touring since he was 19 years old, and now he's like 84, 85 years old, and he's still doing it. Yeah, I just I met him so last I, year. I, I he's amazing. I don't think you can speak to, to the Beatles as being the greatest you know, band of all time when you got those kind of guys. I'm like, I, I, I hate rankings, period. You know, I just, I just like to all throw them in a superior bucket, you know? I know what you're saying. Superior. I mean, Even though the Beatles are only banned for six, six, six years, you know, they're still a, a tremendous band. I agree. I hate rankings as well. Although we are the top uh, radio station, we're probably the best radio uh, program in the entire country. But you know, well, let's, this let's... is what I hear, and why I'm on the phone with you guys. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> do you? Who do you feel like right now is currently the the in terms of modern blues? Who do you feel like is right now the biggest the biggest star? Has the most effect? I, I would most probably influence? say the Kelly Bell Band. <laughs> I've got a good agree answer. With that. Good answer. <laughs> Heard of them. <laughs> we're going we're uh, to get those guys on one day. star right now. Um, They're too big for us. You know, blues is a funny thing because it's, although it's traditionally a black music, you know, black American, you know, at least in its root. Right. Because it, it stems from gospel music. Um, it's been kept alive at least since the 80s from middle-aged white men. Yeah. But that's a great thing and a screwed up thing because middle-aged white men got money. <laughs> so they have kept blues a lot. Yeah. They've kept it in commercials and TV. But what do they have to be blue about? Else. But what's, mad, what's bad about it is that middle-aged white men are always looking for the next guitar hero. Okay. And, yeah. and, and when they look for it, they look for the next little young white kid, you know, that, that'll be the next Stevie Ray Vaughan or, or the next Chris Duarte or the next Kenny Wayne Shepherd, mm-hmm. or You know, so that they... they dump all this money and attention into them and they get all of this press and then the problem is and I, and I know this because I've talked to cats like Chris Duarte you know who I've played with and once the, these kids are old enough to actually play I mean to drink in the bars that they've been playing in since mm-hmm. they were 15, 16 years old mm-hmm. th- then the blues community doesn't have a whole lot of use for them anymore True. and it's, and it's smart of guys like Kenny Wayne Shepherd who stepped out into the rock and roll Role community, yeah. he was smart enough to get his, his record played on rock, on rock stations, mm-hmm. not just like you know homegrown blue stations or you know college stations. I mean, even though that's you know the root really of real music, and the homegrown stations and the college stations are the real homegrown music. You know, because it's not produced, it's not shoved down your throat, it's not Mer- American Idol up yet. Yeah. But yeah. Um, you know. It, those cats, they, they look for these kids to come and do it, and as soon as they're old enough, they, they just don't have any use for them anymore. And it's really sad, and a lot of them end up having drug problems, alcohol problems. I mean, I mean, if you think I'm lying, all you got to do is go to the web and look it up. Oh, okay, yeah. sure. And, and they, have, they have big problems, you know, after that. Um, because they, you know, you get used to all this attention and all this notoriety, and then all of a sudden, Overnight, as as much as you were overnight sensation, now all of a sudden overnight you can't get booked in the same club that you were turning down. Right. You know, six months right. ago. Yeah, it's all that that current heat. I'll tell you. Across the yeah. board with Ian the Colonel here with Kelly Bell of the Kelly Bell Band. May have heard of him. Kelly, if you had say five to ten minutes left, depending on how long the song is, could be twenty minutes left in your life, and you knew this, what one song would you want to go out to? Was it be the last song that you hear? 
or perform? It can be yours or anybody else's. Wow. Um, if it was my song, um, it would be a tie between Moving On, mm-hmm. oh, yeah. which is on our album Chasing the Sun, Yep. Uh, or uh, Dear Maggie. Okay, ooh, on great song. Our very first record. Yeah. And the only reason I say that, uh, Dear Maggie, really, uh, is because it took three and a half years to write. That was the longest wow. that it's ever taken me to write a song. I just kept putting it down and picking it up and putting it down and picking it up. Hmm. Um, and, it, you know, it has a lot of personal meaning, as, as, as most of our songs do. But uh, I guess it, it, if it had to be that, it would be that. Um, if I had to pick someone else's song, uh, it'd either be Charlie by Fishbone. Oh, okay. um, It would be... Uh, wow. Iron Man by Black Sabbath. Okay. No Class by Motorhead. Okay. Yes. Or... Um, oh, The World's The Greatest Song Ever Made, which is I'll Take Care of You by Bobby Blue Bland. Good. Wow, that's a good one to go out to as well, I think. Yeah, if I had to pick one song, honestly, and answer that question, it would have to be the Bobby Bland song, I'll Take Care of You. Yeah, that's a great one to, to go out with, yeah. and just any blues song, just incredible. Anyway, for the pure, raw, visceral emotion in a blues song, it's just, it's just yeah. amazing, I'll and tell you. And Kelly Bell, you know, being that voice that he has, and, you know, when you said moving on, I'm thinking about that, and I hear, you know, I hear him singing that, and... I just I, I I agree with that. I think yeah. that's a great song, and and just the way that you sing that with so much emotion. Um, yeah, yeah. I, d- I I'm so lucky, man. And I, that one song, and I, that's a lot of songs. And I, you guys got time for a real quick, real quick story? Go for it. Yeah. Uh, you know our song. Uh, well, we I met this guy named Steve. Okay. At this big wine festival that we play every year, and we sold something like nine hundred and something CDs this day. So I mean, wow. at the break. Yeah, we played two sets at this place at this break and and at this place and or during the break there's like 200 people in line. I'm signing CDs, and the line is all the way down the hill. And this guy comes in the other way and he's got his neck brace on. He's walking with uh, like a walker, like one of those one hand walkers. Right. And, you know, he's, and he's got a cast on his arm and a cast on his leg. I mean, he, he looks pretty jacked up, you know. And he's walking in the other way, which really kind of irritates the people who run the merchandise stuff because they're, you know, they structure it so that when I get there, I'm just signing and greeting, you know. Right. They take care of organization. But he came in the other way. So as they were going to, like, you know, try to get him to get in line, I'm looking at him going, there's no way in the world I got walking 200 people away. And then I'm like, we can't make him do that. Plus, there was something in it. And he said to me, hey, can I talk to you for a second? And, and you know how you meet somebody and they just you, you just got to say something to them. Like, right. There's something in it in them and their presentation that says, hey, you know what, you better give this guy a couple seconds. Right. So I step off to the side and I talk to him. And he said, I just want to tell you. I, and I said, hold on, brother, look like you were in an accident. He said, yo, that's what they tell me. He said, turns out that I was in this car accident, apparently, and I ended up in this rehab hospital. And he wasn't able to speak because the brain injury wouldn't allow him to form words. But he said there was a song playing over and over and over in his head. So finally he starts singing it after weeks of being in the hospital. This guy doesn't know his name, doesn't know his family, doesn't know his work, nothing. Mm. And it turns out to be the words to SBI. Really? I love that song. song. Yeah. And fortunately for him and I guess for us, the nurses in the in the rehab hospital were familiar with the band. So when he started singing it, these were the first words that he spoke. Ride with that my baby, running from the FBI. And they were like, hey, that's the Kelly Bell Band. We know that band. And he says, hey, yeah, the Kelly Bell Band. I like those guys. I remember that. And that was the first thing he remembered. How does that and make that you feel? that was the catalyst. That was the catalyst that his brain kind of refiring and picking things back up. And then he was able to start. Then from that, he remembered his job and his, his wife and his kids and his, wow. you know, and everything started to come back. That sense chills up my spine. Yeah, dude. Uh, imagine when I'm standing there sweating like a dog and getting ready to go up, change clothes, and go on for a second set. And he was looking at me and telling me this. He said, "I, I just wanted you to know that I told those nurses in that rehab house, rehab hospital, if I'm ever able to walk out of here under my own power, that I would return with CDs for all of them." So he looked me in the face and said, "So I am here to buy CDs." Wow. And I, my jaw dropped to the ground, dude. Yeah. What do you say and, to and, that? And it's moments like that, and I'm saying it's funerals, and we had a kid that was killed on the way to coming to see our show, and he had just gotten back from Iraq from, oh, from being in the armed services. 
So when I, needless to say, when his when his mother invited me to his service uh, one Saturday morning, I, and, and we had played North Carolina the night before, and we drove all night so I could get back, and literally got back within a half an hour and got you know put my suit on and got over to this park where they were having this memorial service for him, and uh, and his mom and when I got there asked me to sing, and I just I wept so hard. Yeah. And and as I left there, I called on my buddies in the band just to tell them, you know, I'm like, man, you would not believe this. And like he wept on the phone, and my, you know, he's like Kirk, he's like my brother, and he says, he says, man, it's moments like that that we forget that, you know, sometimes you can forget because you're playing shows and you're doing 200 shows a year and you're running from one state to another. You know, I'm wearing eight states this month. Wow. You know, and you're, you're running all over the place. You forget that your music sometimes can mean more. You know, it, that it means as much to other people as it means to you, you know. And and I, I guess that's something that I've never really taken for granted, you know, and always have been. People say you're humble, you know, that you're humble about it, but I'm, I'm not humble because I just don't get it. Like, I'm still fiberglass, you know, fiberglass, but that, that someone could could listen to, to my music the way I listen to, you know, uh, Lightning Hopkins music and right. go, wow, man, I really, you know, I needed that today. And so I have yeah. people come up to, the, to to our shows and, and say, hey, you know what, moving on helped me get through a point in my life and really helped change my life. It's an you incredible know? power. Oh, man, it's, it's insane. And, I mean, I've, I've had this experience five times where people have come up to me with our logo tattooed on them. Wow. The and logo of your, your head and your afro. Of my face. Wow. Yeah, it's like tattooed on them. And, and I'm like, wow. I'm like, but one brother that, you know, has become friends of the band since then, he pulls up to the show. He's driving one one four by four, and his wife's driving the other one. And the license plates say KBB Fan One and KBB Fan Two. Wow! And I'm like, wow! You know, I'm like, you just like it's easy to forget. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's easy to forget how how powerful that is. And FBI actually is one of my favorite songs by you. Just something about that song sticks in my head. Over, I mean, not to. to I mean that's what happened to that guy, I guess as well. But yeah. I mean it, it, you know it. It's just such a catchy song. I love that song and the way you sing it, man. With just that 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 kind of that emotion in it, that right. You know, it's it's. I love that song. But uh, I wonder if it was the last song that like maybe he heard. It was on the radio maybe, or something yeah. like that before he, he got in the accident. CD player or something like that. Yeah, or something like that. That might be it. That's that's amazing. That's an incredible story. Well, Kelly. I yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't have no idea. He doesn't know. I mean, well, he didn't know his own name, so I'm assuming <laughs> he didn't know right. why it stuck in his head. But you know, and I asked his permission to tell that story over and over again. I even told it that day, and I, I got teary eyed on stage in the second set to tell him because I made him stand up. And, and and you know, everybody got up, and this guy got a bigger standing ovation than we did all day. Mm. Yeah. Cause I was just like, it, it was just such an incredible story. Well, but his his standing ovation was was meant for you as well. I would think, you know, I mean, that's part of what you did, you know, going through his story. So uh, I don't know, man. I'm like, you know, I, I could never take that brother's credit for what he came through, but I, I'm I'm happy. I, I'll say this: I'm happy to have been part of it. Mm, incredible. Know, I'm happy to have been part of that part Inc- of a story like that. Yeah, you know? incredible I'll stuff. I'll never take anything like that for granted, for sure. Well, Kelly, I, again, we uh, appreciate it. We're huge, huge fans, and uh, you know, proud of you because you're you're from this area. But you know, you Man, guys are worldwide. Of Maryland graduate. That's yes. right. Yeah, we're you know, it's the same. Uh, times over, actually. Same system. Yeah, you have what four degrees? What are your degrees in? Uh, I have a associate's in mental health, a bachelor's in psychology, a bachelor's in social work, and a master's in social work. All right, nice. and you're in a band. Well, that's in a professional wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> Take the work for the man, for the for the guy who said you can't do it all. He clearly has not met me. Oh wow, <laughs> that's the truth, man. Well, Kelly, huge, huge fans. We appreciate it. Uh, check him out, Kelly uh, Kelly Bell Band dot com or Fat Blues P H A T Fat Blues, and uh, definitely go see these guys live. They're all over the, the Mid Atlantic area, but anywhere in the world you are, buy their music, check them out, request they come to your area, and uh, you know we just we appreciate the hell out of you, man. We you know it's, we're such big fans. So uh, I'm, the call across the board, baby. You know it. I mean, he's the Colonel. You're here listening to. Uh, across the board here on acrossthebordradio.com and Hawk Radio, hawkradio.org. Back in a few.